I will start with praising and thanking the Kogut Institute, uh, which she directs and leads for hosting this initiative and giving us all the support needed for the project. Uh, and special thanks to uh, Keith Salisbury and to Trouder Kastner, who took care of all the minute details that uh, made this gathering possible. Thank you. Uh, when we started uh, this series of conferences almost a decade ago, uh, we opened the floor to any discourse and aspect of life uh, that could or should have been politicized. Uh, the annual uh, political confer conference uh, in New York still runs in this way. Uh, but in the last uh, uh, three years, actually, at Brown, uh, we started to focus. Uh, first was the Balibar edition, dedicated to the work of a political philosopher and dear friend who breathed, thinks, and writes concepts, uh, inventing some and revising others. Um, and uh, Jacques, the editor at Fordham, uh, just told me this morning that uh, the book from this conference uh, will come out at the Fordham University. So this was the first focus, uh, edition, focused edition. Uh, the second one last year uh, was dedicated uh, to the infamous uh, Trump. It was called the Trump edition. Um, and this year we have convened uh, scholars uh, to start writing the science edition. Uh, I think that everyone understands here why science, but just for the records, Amanda asked me to say a few words about this question. Uh, so uh, let me spend uh, a uh, few minutes uh, uh, answering the question. Uh, the aloofness of science, its image as a detached sphere of intellectual activity where the search for truth is immune of the social and political, uh, and the political has always been a bit. It is all the more so today when science finds shelter in the corporate university while leaving off the profit-making engines of the corporate economy. At the same time, the authority of science and the validity of its major products, facts and theories that explain them, have recently come under direct political attack by forces that seek to replace research with oracular proclamations of the true and the fake, disseminated through old and new social media. Many scientists have responded with pledging allegiance to the truths they are after, their objective methods, and the facts they discover or establish uh, in laboratories and ivory towers and then disseminate to the public. Students of history, sociology, and anthropology of, of the sciences, and of knowledge more, more generally, know that things are a bit more complicated. And we also all know very well what is at stake. At stake is nothing less than the fate of the human world and the role of science and technology in enabling the forces that threaten to bring this world to an end. But also, the role of the sciences and uh, of the critical thinking that accompanies sci the sciences in understanding these forces and pro processes and devising ways to halt them. Thinking politically about science, uh, the academic framework within which it is uh, situated, has never been more urgent. Many tend to imagine the political element of a theory, an idea, or a concept as a hidden or even a secret quality which critical thinking should seek to out in public. This ha happens often in the realm of knowledge, science and technology. But it may be more useful to think, I think, this is really my personal uh, take on this. I, it is uh, more useful to think about the way concepts become political <clears throat> once they are publicly, publicly contested with respect to their role in constructing a shared world. Concepts become political when the ways in which they affect and are affected by the modes of constructing and sharing a world and the power exercised uh, to sustain those modes are problematized in public. Our conference 
offers a stage and an opportunity for performing such politicization of scientific concepts, extending the work of political reflection while fusing it with the criti critics' engagement as a citizen of a shared world in question. So without further ado, I will give the stage to our two first speakers today, Stephanie Dick and Dan Hirschman. I will introduce them shortly. We do short introductions. We are minimalist in this respect. Uh, <coughs> and then uh, one after the other. Stephanie Dick studies and teaches the history of mathematics and computing in the post-war United States, artificial intelligence, and automated reasoning, software studies, and science studies. She does all this at the Department of History and Sociology of Science, the University of Pennsylvania. Dan Hirschman is a sociologist at the Department of Sociology here at Brown. He studies and teaches the sociology of finance, forms of reasoning in the social sciences, images of knowledge associated with the social sciences and their public market. Great, thank you so much. Um, the in invitation to give a talk that's not just about historicizing a concept, but saying something about how we think that concept ought to traffic in the world and be conceived is a really welcome invitation, although po possibly also a really difficult one. Uh, for historians. So I fear that what I have to say is terribly obvious, uh, but it is born out of a lot of historical reflection on the concept uh, I chose, which is database. And I think it's unfortunate that the talk on database is not going to follow a talk on truth. Um, it's really unfortunate that Anne cannot be here, but maybe it is also appropriate that truth will be absent um, <laughs> from the conversation that we're going to have. Um, so thank you so much to Adi, to Lucas. Uh, it's great to, to be here, to be part of this conversation. So this will be a talk in three parts. Um, oh, I'm advancing on two different machines, so if that goes wrong, I apologize. Um, Part one of this talk I will call How Data Got Its Base. This is an objectively plagiarized title for my colleague Thomas Haig, who is sort of the definitive authority on the history of administrative and business computing, uh, and also writes about the early invention of the concept of a database uh, in the 1950s and 60s, which I'll say a little bit about. Um, following this discussion, I want to talk about how data lost its base. Um, in particular, I want to look at a transformation in the character, the meaning, the value, and the uses of data, the way it's structured and what kind of information is derived from it um, that accompanies the rise of machine learning methods as opposed to earlier kinds of data management practices in the mid-century, in the 80s and 90s. And then what I have most to say is that data should get its base back. Um, I would like to advocate for kind of return to database thinking as it was framed in the 50s and 60s, not because of its relationship to business computing, uh, but because of its relationship to archives and libraries, which I would like to put forward as a kind of alternative epistemological framework that we might bring to bear on data and not walk ourselves into as many tricky uh, political positions. So in order to talk about these three things, I'm going to actually use examples of data uh, in the criminal justice and domestic law enforcement context. Um, my thinking about databases is born out of what might become my second project, which is a history of early facial recognition software and the role it played in the establishment of sort of standardized and centralized police databases, especially in the state of New York, beginning in 1965. So even though this is a history of science conference, I'm going to be talking a bit about law enforcement to emphasize not just the ways that these forms of collecting and organizing and using data can be used for political purposes, uh, but also because I think criminal justice offers a really clear example of the shift in what data is and how it's used that I'm trying to highlight uh, as a problem here. So I'm going to be talking again about this really early attempt to standardize law enforcement data collection in New York State in the first part. In the second part, I'll talk about one of the most talked about and controversial uses of machine learning in criminal justice, namely the risk assessment scoring systems that are now at use in almost every state in the United States. Uh, and then in talking about how data should get back to its base, I, I'll move away from the law enforcement context somewhat to talk about what different epistemological possibilities sort of attach to these different forms of data collection and use 
in order to advocate for our own knowledge as historians um, as something that could be a useful contribution to this question. So, uh, databases are definitively and clearly a sort of invention of the 1950s and 60s. Um, according to one somewhat problematic database, the term sort of peaks in use in the 1980s, it emerges in the 1960s. It does not, of course, disappear in the 2000s as this engram would indicate. It is just there usurped by the concatenation where database goes from being two nouns to one noun, um, which happens in the 1990s. Um, and crucially, what I want to draw attention to is that in the very first and formidable attempt in the 1970s to take stock of uh, all of the concepts that are, were in, influential for the new academic discipline of computer science, data alone has no entry. Um, so this is the oft-cited sort of first attempt to conceptualize what the content of computer science was. There is no entry on data. Uh, there is, however, an entry on database where you can see them sort of struggling to recognize or articulate what it is um, databases are and do. So they write, the term database has yet to achieve a widely accepted standard meaning. That is still true. Um, however, it is to some extent accepted as conveying a more sophisticated concept than the older term file, which was carried over into data processing terminology from the pre-computer era. Unfortunately, it is all too frequently used when all that is implied is a conventional file. The difference between a database and a file in terms prior to the advent of data processing is perhaps analogous to the difference between a thoroughly cross-referenced set of files and cabinets in a library or in an office and a single file in one cabinet which is not cross-referenced in any way. So even beginning in early computer days, there was this concept of a file born out of the file folder um, in which information or data was stored and organized. The idea of the database was to do in a digital way what librarians, archivists, but also business administrators had been doing all through the 19th century and into the uh, early 20th century, which is organize, cross-reference, and add structure to the way that information was stored in files so that if you were a business administrator and you wanted to produce an annual report, this was one of the sort of primary data processing activities of the early 20th century, um, you could search or query a cross-reference database to get information like how many customers bought this product, uh, to what cities did we ship this product, um, how many people bought this product and also this product the kinds of cross-referencing between files that might contain single product sales or single consumers uh, could be cross-referenced in order to produce the kinds of business-oriented reports that uh, most of our computing energy was spent producing, especially in the mid-century. I also wanted to begin with this entry from the encyclopedia because it makes very explicit that databases at this time were conceived uh, through analogy and also through historical connection to earlier efforts to cross-reference and organize and structure information both in businesses uh, and in libraries. And this kind of structuring and cross-referencing doesn't just disappear with the advent of machine learning. It is considered bad for knowledge production to pre-structure or organize information and data for use in uh, modeling systems. They go on to say, uh, oh yes, I just highlighted that part for you. <laughs> um, so in the uh, all too famous McGraw-Hill yellow books for computer science, there's an addition on each thing that was conceived to be an important element of computer science study. Uh, the database design book published in 1977 diagrammatically represents a database this way. So databases contain a bunch of files which contain a specific kind of information, but they are cross-referenced in key ways in advance um, by the people structuring them, by the people designing the database. Uh, there's a lot to say about the knowledge that goes in and the action that comes out that I'll maybe say a bit more about at the end, but I just wanted to show a uh, sort of visual representation of databases as being collections of files with a whole bunch of processing procedures that were meant to enable people to query them in different ways. And throughout the literature on databases in the 60s and the 70s, there is this explicit emphasis on flexibility. 
that people should be able to search a database in lots of different ways. People who care about you know, the sales of bathtubs or people who care about correlations between bathtubs and kitchen tables. Uh, somebody else might care about income brackets. Uh, there's this emphasis on flexibility of search that we should build databases so that people whose needs we can't necessarily anticipate can come to them and search them and get meaningful information out. And database design is meant to spare the user all of the really expensive computation that happens behind the scenes to make that kind of storage and access and cross-referencing possible. Um, I hesitate to show this because I'm not even quite sure what to say about it, uh, but, but Wiederhold also includes this incredible <coughs> diagram of a database as a brick wall uh, with lots of activities taking place at the same time. Um, the database itself is like a brick wall being pieced together with new bricks all the time. You also have to be able to update and change information um, in any particular file by swapping bricks out or updating them. But the best part, of course, are the little footprints of someone querying the database, planting their flag, retrieving what information they wanted from this structured and cross-referenced organizational scheme. Um, and what I like about that part of the image is it emphasizes that databases are about human users. The, the little footprints are like the trace of human agency deciding where to look, what to look for, what to query, what to ask. Um, so once again, I just wanted to um, give credit where credit is due. Thomas Haig is the historian who has done the really tedious work of recovering the actual origins of computing practice in the early and mid 20th century in the archives of not the defense establishment and elite universities, but businesses and business administrators. Um, it's really tedious work, uh, and he sort of articulates the early origins of databasing in uh, all the way back to filing practices and uh, report producing practices in business administration in the 1930s um, that get built directly into database management systems, which by the way are in operation behind the scenes in so much of our computing infrastructure still today, but they are no longer, I think, the primary epistemological framework uh, for what data is and how it works. I wanted to also call attention to a different term that appears just before database in the Encyclopedia of Computer Science, which is data bank. Um, and data bank is a really interesting term that has mostly uh, gone out of fashion, and it's computer science speak for a database that is political. <laughs> um, they explicitly articulate that data bank is a term for the collections of information that government agencies, law enforcement agencies collect about individuals. They indicate that data banks raise all kinds of concerns about privacy, about access, um, and then for them, database is a completely technical term. Um, drawing once again from our helpful database of Google Books, um, the word data bank has largely disappeared from the way that people talk about data, but it was the term for a political database in the mid-century. And one explanation of this uh, is that people have forgotten, maybe, that all databases are data banks. That's one way to summarize uh, what history of science that studies data exists. All databases are data banks. Instead, it seems like the opposite has happened, which is the overt political infrastructure for data collection has been erased from the way that we talk about databases. So it perhaps should have been the term database that disappeared. Uh, instead, it was the term data bank that has fallen out of favor, highlighting the supposed objectivity of these data collecting practices, when in fact, um, at least in the mid-century, there were two separate terms to talk about data organization and structure, one that explicitly referenced the political infrastructure and the other that erases it. So one um, infamous, famous, uh, important um, database slash data bank uh, was founded in 1965. It's the New York State Identification <coughs> and Intelligence System, or NISIS. Uh, NISIS currently just refers to an algorithm for identifying a name in a large data bank, uh, but it began as a first attempt to standardize the records that law enforcement agencies were keeping and that police departments kept about searches and seizures, about arrests, um, and about prosecutions and jail time, and it was a highly celebrated effort 
uh, by politicians seeking to fight the war on crime in the 1960s. They produced a lot of videos about the dangerous crime was producing or uh, posing, especially to the state of New York. And really what it was was an attempt to standardize what information was collected and how it was collected from people who had been arrested. So they proposed that every police department in New York State had to use the same card. They had to put fingerprints in the same part of the card. They had to record the same information about someone that had been arrested. Um, they had to uh, it, store all this information and put it into a computer in the same way. Standardization was the primary project. It's not that police departments didn't collect information before. They just didn't do it in a standardized way. And so NISIS was meant to piggyback on existing infrastructure of data collection to produce this big system of databases that was meant to, um, and this is important, was meant to ease and expedite investigation. This was a database that was meant to make it easier to investigate crimes, easier to identify uh, if a person who had been arrested here had been arrested before, um, and various things that police officers and arresting agents and lawyers are interested in. So given a criminal justice event, police officers were meant to be able to query this database in different ways in order to find out information about a defendant that before they would have had to call around um, and navigate lots of informal and unstandardized <laughs> methods of information collection to find. So the police officer is reimagined as a kind of navigator of a database in doing investigative work. The teletype, existing teletype systems um, of the criminal justice infrastructure of the United States were seen as the existing infrastructure that could be used to standardize the collection of data about um, people who had been arrested such that they could be queried to assist uh, investigative work. They also imagined maybe they could use these databases to automate various parts of police investigation, including automatic license plate recognition, automatic fingerprint matching, also automated facial recognition, and all of these desires to automate recognition practices informed the way that they standardized uh, the data collection across different precincts and counties in New York State. So NICE has represented an attempt to use the emergent study of databasing practices where you collect information in a certain way, you organize it in a certain way in order to make it searchable for the needs of police officers and lawyers. So the goal was always to anticipate the querying needs of investigative lawyers and police officers um, in interrogating an increasingly standardized database about criminal events. Um, of course, this raised also a red flag for uh, politicians and lawyers who were worried about privacy, who were worried about access, who were worried about what kind of information should get stored, and it was on the back of the creation of NISIS that Congress held its first hearings about the constitutionality of so-called criminal justice data banks. Um, and I bring this up because the kind of conversation you have about a database like this is really different than the kind of legal and ethical conversations that are being had about data-driven criminal justice methods today, and I'll talk about the latter earlier. But there are questions where what kind of information should be stored in a database like this? When should data be erased from the data bank? Uh, what degree of access to this database should different agencies and individual, individuals have? Who is responsible for maintaining a data bank like this? So they were motivated by situations where a person had been arrested, acquitted, someone else had been found guilty of a crime, that information remains in the bank, that person can't get a job. Uh, or cases in which someone is found not guilty of something that they were formally charged for and all that information remains in the data bank. These are questions about what should be saved, what should be deleted, and what kinds of agencies should have what kind of access to this database. Um, this, I would actually like to argue by the end, is a very good conversation for Congress to have about privacy, about uh, the constitutionality of criminal justice, um, data collection, where the questions we're having now are ridiculous. <laughs> uh, okay, so um, to, to, sum, to summarize, um, the early picture of databases, insofar as I've had time to sort of tease it out for you, has these direct, explicit, historical, and structural connections to the kinds of records that businesses keep, 
but also to the kinds of work that libraries uh, do to organize and cross-reference uh, and structure information in order to anticipate the searching needs of users. Everything about this 1950s and 60s vision of a database was meant to serve the user, to manage and organize data in order to enable and expedite the kind of searching that users wanted to do, even if those users are police officers and lawyers. But there's a kind of epistemological flexibility in this vision of data. Of course, your searches are constrained by what data has been collected, how it's been cross-referenced, how it's been structured, but it's a kind of construction that also offers flexibility and was designed to do so in the kind of questions they imagined users might want to ask. Of course, all storage mechanisms and databasing practices have a kind of panoptic potential, and of course these databases are used to surveil citizens, but they do so in ways that I think are crucially different from the regimes at work today. They also engender really specific legal and ethical debates. Privacy means something different in this kind of data collection and search infrastructure than it means today, and it means something I think far more humanist. Uh, these questions about what, we sh what should we store, how should it circulate it, who should maintain this, who should have access, uh, these are very different questions than the ones we're currently talking about that emerged from a process I'm calling um, the loss of the base of the data. Uh, so I have in mind, of course, the rise of machine learning methods in the 1980s and 90s, and there is in that time, I propose a kind of epistemological collapse that takes place with an increased emphasis on prediction and predictive accuracy as what data can offer us that accompanies machine learning methods. Um, so the goal with machine learning, of course, is not to leave the humans to cross-reference and query our own databases, to give them their structure and organization with our own needs and interests in mind, to engender flexible, possible modes of search in the future. Machine learning was oriented around the project of letting computers examine our data as unstructured as possible to find its own organizational principles, its own correlations and patterns and structures in order to make good predictions or good classifications. Uh, predictive accuracy becomes the value of data, and it is quite divorced from the needs and interests of particular users, um, even when they are the police. So we go from organizing and querying our own digital databases as we would in a library or a business, to inputting data into a system that we often cannot follow or understand. And there are a lot of origin stories to tell about machine learning. Um, one of those origin stories is forthcoming from Matt Jones, uh, who emphasizes defense establishment research and pattern recognition and a return to a kind of instrumentalism um, in computing as the origin of machine learning. Uh, but for the sake of time, I'm going to point to one place in particular, um, which was Leslie Valiant's now very classic piece from uh, not inappropriately the year 1984, um, a theory of the learnable. And he won a Turing Award for this line of research, but it's here that he introduces the idea of a probably approximately correct learning algorithm, um, his words. And it's from, um, oh, sorry, probably approximately correct ideas of learning that what's now called the statistical learning framework emerged in the 80s and 90s and has become sort of dominant paradigm in machine learning today. And it comes from the idea that you have an algorithm that takes a whole bunch of data as its input and its output is a so-called prediction rule or classifier that is probably correct. So if your data set is about medicine, you'll collect as much data as you possibly can about symptoms, about diagnoses, and you will, tr you will allow your algorithm to train on that data set looking for its own correlations and patterns and the output of that algorithm will be a rule for predicting on a given set of symptoms what disease correlates with it that will be probably approximately correct. Um, and if this sounds absurd, it should, <laughs> I think. Um, it is a, a wild idea that we would invest so much money and time and theoretical work on the project of making good predictions and producing good classifiers. Um, this is the very classic 
uh, Cambridge published uh, Understanding Machine Learning textbook that gets taught um, all over the place where they give a really clear formal articulation of the statistical learning framework in which basically you give uh, your training algorithm a whole bunch of data and its output is the, the prediction rule, the classifier for going from, in this case, papayas and being tasty to the prediction of whether some papaya will be tasty. Um, <laughs> Uh, underneath most of these really successful machine learning models are neural networks. They take in a whole bunch of data, unstructured, as I said, our most successful predictive algorithms come out of data that is as little structured as possible. Um, neural networks just do a whole bunch of like little calculations on that data and map uh, different patterns and correlations and the output is a prediction rule. Usually, our most successful models are what's called uh, non-interpretable, which means you don't get to look inside the box and see which parameters correlate strongly with the output. You just have to accept it for its predictive accuracy. Um, and this sort of epistemological uh, collapse of what data is for, what its value is that comes from um, the design of neural networks, the em emphasis on predictive accuracy um, is something that we're sort of squaring with today. I can't uh, let this pass without mentioning Joanne Radin's paper. Um, predictive accuracy changes what's valuable and useful about the data that we collect. So data goes from being useful to particular communities who want to query it for particular information to being just how good a data set is for producing uh, rules for prediction. Uh, and Joanna writes about a particular case where medical data was collected from the Pima people originally as a way to try and help them with their medical um, problems and that data set turned out to be really valuable for training predictive algorithms and the data trafficked in the world entirely independent of its original intended use um, and is being used to predict things like manhole explosions in New York City. So data becomes valuable not because of who it was collected from nor because of what particular users want to query it for. It becomes useful insofar as it is good at training predictive algorithms. Um, that is the epistemological paradigm of machine learning. Uh, and in the criminal justice case, by comparison, uh, machine learning models of this kind are being used to do what's called risk assessment scoring. Um, so risk assessment algorithms produce a number between 0 and 10 for any given defendant. Uh, and those numbers can predict how likely a defendant is to show up for their trial if they're released on bail, how likely that defendant is to reoffend, assuming they have offended already, if uh, released on bail or from prison, and also how likely a defendant is to commit a violent crime. Um, risk assessment scores are being given to judges in almost every state in the United States, but there's very little transparency about how judges are using these numbers, when these numbers have led a judge to change their sentence or their burial ruling, um, but they are increasingly proliferating as a, the, the idea of course is that this kind of scoring could um, correct for racial bias or other forms of bias in judges' sentencing. Um, and so to, to really get at the difference between this kind of data use in criminal justice and the sort of data bank of standardized intake information and querying for investigative purposes that was all the rage in the 50s and 60s, uh, I'll talk about one particularly infamous risk assessment scoring system developed uh, by a company called North Point. It's called the Compass Score. This has been getting a lot of press uh, and is, is interesting to talk about. Uh, it stands for Correctional Offender Management Profiling for Alternative Sanctions. Um, the company was founded in 19, uh, 1989 by a, statist a statistician and a man who ran a correctional facility in Michigan. Um, the latter invited the former to come to his prison and see if he could do statistical studies on the inmates there, make predictions about their behavior, their paroling, um, their likelihood to be involved in an incident, uh, and the kind of data collected to build the Compass database, which is then used to make predictions about defendants' likelihood to uh, commit another offense or show up for their trial, are very different than name, age, weight, height, fingerprints, address, the kind of information that goes in to the other database. They're asking questions like, uh, based on the screener's observations, is this person suspected uh, or admitted gang member? 
Um, they ask questions about a person's criminal history. They also ask about um, whether a person has lived with both parents, separated parents, one biological parent, two biological parents. They ask about um, how many of the friends or acquaintances of a given defendant have ever been arrested. Clearly, they're trying to identify the right reference classes through which they could output an algorithm that makes good predictions about criminal behavior, and in so doing, they build into their data collection assumptions about what reference classes are likely to lead a person to offend in certain ways. So their database is proprietary, we don't know about it. It's only thanks to ProPublica investigative journalism that we even know what this form looks like and the kinds of questions that are being asked uh, when defendants are arrested. Um, and the reason the score is being used, this scoring system is being used in um, courtrooms around the country is because it has good predictive accuracy. And also the claim is that the algorithm is unbiased because it has equal predictive accuracy for all defendants. And here is where things start to get very interesting. So they published this paper about the predictive accuracy of their scoring system. They, they indicate it's a 68% predictive accuracy overall, and crucially, it's, 60, it's accurate for black men 67% of the time, accurate for white men 69% of the time. And these were the grounds that lawyers and judges and Congress people were assuaged that this was not gonna introduce racial bias of a different kind um, into law enforcement. ProPublica wanted to test this hypothesis. They did an empirical study of, on upwards of 18,000 uses of this risk assessment scoring system in Florida between the years of 2013 and 2014 to see whether or not actually the number assigned to a defendant mapped on to their behavior. Um, of course, there's a problem. Uh, if you don't release someone on bail, you can never test whether they would have shown up for their trial date or not. So it's uh, difficult to empirically test this kind of thing. And the ProPublica famous finding was that actually Compass was right. Um, their scoring system was equally predictively accurate for all of the defendants they looked at. However, there was racial bias in the error and the error rates of the algorithm. So when it was right, it was right the same percentage of the time for black defendants and white defendants, but it was wrong twice as often. So um, you're twice as likely to be assigned a false negative um, if you are a white defendant and four, almost four times as likely to be assigned a false positive if you're a black defendant. Um, so black defendants are almost twice as likely as white defendants to be, sorry, I got that wrong, labeled a higher risk but not actually reoffend. It makes the opposite mistake among white defendants. They're much more likely than black defendants to be labeled lower risk but go on to commit other crimes. So ProPublica's finding was that by focusing so much on predictive accuracy, they had missed this other form of racial bias that had made its way uh, into the use of risk assessment scores. Um, just some more information about that. So equal predictive accuracy produced unequal error rates in this case. And then computer scientists heard about this, um, and they were worried, of course, because predictive accuracy, the holy grail, the epistemological goal of machine learning, um, had led maybe to this problem. But this was an empirical result. Uh, however, three machine learning theorists uh, published this paper in 2017 um, where they had discovered that actually these trade-offs between different kinds of, uh, different kinds of fairness uh, were mutually exclusive. You could not actually optimize an algorithm to be both equally predictively accurate and have equal error rates on the same training set um, and using the same modeling system. So um, they write, recent discussions in the public sphere about algorithmic classification has involved tension between competing notions of what it means for a probabilistic calculation to be fair to different groups. We formalize three different fairness conditions. So equal predictive accuracy, equal error rates. They also have one about the equal distribution of numbers among a particular subset of the population. We formalize three fairness conditions that lie at the heart of these debates and prove that except in highly constrained special cases, which I assure you law enforcement is not, um, there is no method that can satisfy these three conditions simultaneously. 
So where the questions about privacy, about ethics, about constitutionality that accompanied the emergence of standardized data banks for law enforcement in the 50s and 60s were about who should have access to this, uh, what kinds of stuff should get erased once somebody's been acquitted, uh, what kinds of um, investigative questions should police officers be allowed to ask, now we're talking about what do we mean by being equal before the law? Does that mean equal predictive accuracy or equal error rates? What has been a humanist question about fairness, about constitutionality, about legality, is now being discussed and debated in quantitative terms related to the limitations, the formal limitations on machine learning systems. Um, Google, Facebook, Amazon, everybody now has a fairness team the cutting edge machine learning theorists who study these problems, um, who are meant to be adjudicating questions of bias and fairness, but in this epistemological context, uh, not in the other one, which I think is um, far more humane, as I said. Also, we really don't know why or how lots of these machine learning models are able to make the good predictions that they're able to make. Uh, because our especially deep neural nets are, they, you know, they function as a, or they, they operate as a function of a crazy huge number of parameters, and we never get to know how any one parameter, like growing up with biological parents or having friends who've been arrested, contributes to the outcome. Uh, and that makes it very hard to challenge the assumptions about criminality that have been built into these systems in the way that the data is being collected. Um, just to compare, the neural network uh, image also has data going in and something coming out, but our friend from the 1950s and 60s has knowledge going into the data, going into the system whose structure has been chosen by a person thinking about what the querying needs of its users are, and what comes out is information, apparently, and also action. So I don't want to romanticize too much the database practices of the 50s and 60s, except to indicate that the significance of users and also human agency in the design um, is always there. So just to summarize and sort of by way of conclusion, data lost its base, I propose, um, in this epistemological contraction of what data is useful for to emphasize only predictive accuracy. The meaning and also the value of data is transformed in that change, becomes increasingly abstracted from its context and the needs of its original creators. It's divorced from questions about what users might want to query a database for. All that matters is how well data trains predictors. Um, and this data isn't for investigation. It's not investigative data um, where you know, police are interested in investigating a crime or some, some person is interested in formulating their own research question and asking it uh, through a sort of structured data set. Um, this kind of data is, is used in sentencing and in the worst sort of case, uh, worst case, um, pre-crime policing, and there are pilot projects to imagine how, if you have a good prediction that somebody's gonna commit a crime who has not yet, uh, is there a way to intervene? Um, and uh, there are countries in the world who are already exploring this possibility. So I want to emphasize that different legal and ethical debates <laughs> attach to different meanings of data, different ways of organizing data. Um, here, in this case, we're talking about fairness and quantitative trade-offs instead of privacy access, what should be erased, what should be kept. Um, so basically, to summarize and to conclude, because I'm out of time, um, I think the data should get its base back. Uh, and part of this impulse is born out of um, a belief that there's a real connection between 1950s and 60s databasing practices and something that we are all a lot more familiar with, namely the archive. Um, archives are collected by people, they are organized by people, and archivists as humanists are very interested in the question of where their data should come from, how they should structure it, and what the needs of possible searching users might be, and that we should hold on really tightly to the epistemological flexibility and the human agency that attaches to that vision of data collection that has largely been lost in this machine learning reimagining of data. Um, and I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, and now we uh, move to Stylus. Good morning. Uh, thank you all for having me. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, it's a real honor. Uh, when I got the invitation to participate in this conference, uh, I admit I was a little nervous. 
because um, I wasn't quite sure what concept I could take on. Um, I hadn't had the chance to attend the previous conferences, and um, I was just sort of lost in this, this possibility of, of really thinking big and broad and trying to rethink something, um, but I was also a, a little nervous. And so I ended up um, just sort of pitching the project I've been working on for a couple of years now. But backing up, I think there's a way to reframe it that maybe gets closer to the ambitions of the conference. Um, this project emerged out of my research on the history of economics, and particularly the history of how economists measure things. Um, things ranging from national economies, national income, GDP, GMP, et cetera, to smaller things or more local things like unemployment rates or um, income inequality, as we'll talk a lot about today. And as I was doing this research, um, I started realizing that I was having a sort of problem explaining my work to my colleagues in sociology and history especially, because I had sort of accidentally adopted a term from my actors without realizing it. That I'd sort of started using the jargon of stylized facts, and then I started getting a lot of blank stares. Um, because my colleagues didn't know what this term meant, and I hadn't realized it was a term that sort of needed to be interrogated. And so I started looking around, and I realized that um, stylized facts, this term, and I'll explain that more in a second, are used quite widely by economists, that, that explicit framing. But it's a term that really captures um, part of a broader problem, which is the problem of description. And I think this actually follows really nicely from the previous talk, um, because so much of our conversation in the <coughs> machine learning space is about prediction, while in the social sciences, particularly in economics and sociology, so much of the conversation is about explanation and causality. Um, so this project is partly about trying to undermine a bit the hegemony of causal thinking in the social sciences. And in particular, the idea that the only important or influential or real or true or good social science is social science that does causal explanatory work. And so what I want to do is sort of pick up on one of the ways that economists in particular, but also other social scientists, uh, have been doing descriptive work in really important, interesting ways, but not sort of reflecting on what they're doing. Um, so uh, that's what sort of led to this project about sort of how social scientists do particularly quantitative description, which is not the way we tend to think about things, but we actually do tons of it all the time, especially in the social sciences. Um, so with that preamble, I'll start with a sort of example um, of one of the facts I'm working on. You all probably recognize figures like this one. Uh, they circulate all the time uh, in various kinds of virtualized forms, tracking what's called the pay gap or the earnings gap or the wage gap. That is sort of the differences in average earnings of men and women, uh, usually in a, in a particular country, um, usually controlling for very little. Uh, the standard version of this fact circulates just controlling for full-time work. So looking at the average wages of men and women who work full-time, uh, how different are they, and how has that changed over time? This is kind of the standard formulation of what's called the gender pay gap. And there's tons and tons of research on this topic, and there's tons and tons of public discourse. This number circulates super widely, it gets turned into memes, you see more complicated versions of it. Um, it's also connected strongly to particular policy proposals. Um, so every year you get um, an equal pay day, which is the day to which women are in some sense working for free, in that they have to work that long to make back the wages they didn't earn the previous year. Um, more recently you've seen equal pay days broken down by race. You'll see a different equal pay day for Latino women, for Native American women, et cetera, uh, reflecting their different and even lower uh, pay relative to white men. Um, but you see numbers like this circulate uh, attached to formulations like equal payday, we're trying to reshape the calendar around this particular number, and attached to particular policies. Uh, in this case, a uh, policy that was pushed by the Obama administration called the Paycheck Fairness Act that would have made it easier for employees to share their uh, compensation for the purposes of trying to figure out if there was discrimination happening without fear of reprisal. So it was an attempt to sort of work on a particular aspect of gender inequality, um, which is sort of different pay for the same work. Um, and that's gonna become important to the story um, I'm not going to get into the details of the case too much, but a lot of the confusion around this number has to do with the, the sort of different way that the law thinks about inequality and discrimination and the way that sort of social scientists have measured it and tracked it. And so um, what figures like this sort of suggest is that 77 cents on the dollar is sort of a direct measure of something that is unlawful or illegitimate. Um, but social scientists would be quick to point out, um, and sort of the history of the number is all about pointing out, that most of that gap is about different occupations, different levels of experience, um, different uh, actual hours worked, even just controlling for full-time work, I mean, work fewer hours in that category than men, the way it's measured, um, things like that. And so there's sort of a, a systematic miscommunication that tends to happen um, around this particular number, and it's not unique in that sense. 
And so I'm interested in sort of that kind of thing. Um, and inner wage gap's a great example because you get tons and tons of discourse about it. Um, so for example, uh, just last year, uh, the Trump administration uh, sort of worked to halt uh, a rule that was implemented uh, when the Paycheck Fairness Act didn't pass. The Obama administration tried to create some new rules toward the same effect. And sort of a direct linkage between sort of policy proposals around wages and pay and fairness and shrinking the gender wage gap. This descriptive quantitative number becomes a target for policymakers. Um, and it also becomes a place where you see uh, conversations sliding back and forth between the academic and the political. And so in this story about uh, this particular policy change, you get quotes from Francine Blau, who's an economist, um, and you see framings like this uh, sort of nicely capturing sort of the space of the debate. And so this is from that New York Times article. It says, federal law has banned pay discrimination since 1963. Women, though, still earn on average of 79 cents for every dollar paid to men. The gap is larger for black women who take home 60 cents for every white man's dollar and Hispanic women who average out at 55 cents. Francine Blau, an economist at Cornell University, found in a recent study that women's career decisions account for about 60% uh, of that gap, while about a third is left unexplained. That leaves room, she determined, for employer bias, unconscious or otherwise. So you see this sort of nice hinge or connection between kind of the academic researchers on one hand, uh, the policy debate on the other, there's kind of a discussion of sort of what the law allows or doesn't, and these things all get sort of uh, run together quite quickly. Um, and so that's the kind of conversation I'm interested in, in sort of the space between and the connections between the sort of academic researchers on one side, public conversations on the other. Um, the gender wage gap, um, and you also see here there's an intense focus on uh, once you've described the number, or described the situation, then trying to sort of partial out different explanations. So it opens up space for explanation, but it's actually the number itself that sort of prompts the conversation. Um, and this number has prompted a particularly large amount of conversation. So in addition to things like the Equal Pay Day, uh, every single year the American Association of University Women puts out a report titled something like this, uh, The Simple Truth About the Gender Pay Gap. Um, and every year is a kind of ritualized counterperformance. Conservative organizations like the American Enterprise Institute and Heritage put out uh, op-eds and reports titled things like the mythical pay equity crisis um, and the wage gap myth that won't die. And there's a sort of constant um, back and forth uh, where different parties sort of take the same number and argue it means something quite different. Um, and so I'm really interested backing up in sort of trying to understand what kind of a thing this number is. Like what does it mean to talk about something like a gender wage gap? Um, and how do things like this circulate? How do they move back and forth between different spaces? Um, what kind of work do they do in each of those spaces? Um, why are academics spending time on this? Why are policymakers invoking them? Why are activists invoking them? <clears throat> and then how do they come to have a truth or a myth? This is what I love particularly about the framing from the American Association of University Women and from the AEI, is there's a sense that like, that this number is true or mythical or something like it's invested with a lot of, uh, of power in that sense. And then back to the sort of prompt I started with, what can studying things like this tell about the role or the power of social scientific description as distinct from the emphasis you might get if you go talk to people in the policy school or, or in political science or economics where it's all about how do we identify causality? Um, and sort of skipping over this step of describing the world before we try to figure out why it's moving the way it's moving. And so I'm interested in sort of tracing numbers like the under wage gap to make sense of the work that social scientific description does. Um, what I'm gonna argue is that the under wage gap is a good example of this class of, of claims or class of arguments, which we can call stylized facts, which are a kind of quantitative description. And I'm going to argue that among academics, particularly among economists in a very explicit way, but also among other social scientists in a little bit more of an implicit way, that stylized facts do some of the same work that phenomena do in the social sciences. That is, they're the things that we make models to explain. Uh, stylized facts, though, also travel out and do this work as a sort of like social movement frames. They can, they can be numbers that get picked up and run with by activists, advocates, policymakers, etc. But despite serving as kind of hinges or boundary objects you know, spanning these communities, um, sometimes there's uh, mistranslations or miscommunications as we're sort of familiar with in science studies when sort of not objects of knowledge travel back and forth in communities, they don't always mean the same thing or do the same work in each community. And you sort of see that here, where the same number can take on a very different meaning in different contexts. Um, and often the sort of explanations that social scientists produce 
don't necessarily travel with the numbers or the descriptions that were motivating those uh, explanations. Um, so t I'm going to frame the talk around this sort of conversation in uh, sociology of expertise, science studies, et cetera, about the role of experts in politics. And then I'll talk about what stylized facts are, how I'm defining them. Um, and then I'll give sort of a brief history of sort of how they've been used in the social sciences. And I'll talk briefly about sort of the cases I'm looking at for the larger project, but I won't get into any one of them in particular. And then I'll end with a few thoughts about what this means for how we should think about the role of the social sciences. Um, so the motivation for this project, sort of the more, uh, the, the literature I've mostly been engaged with, is this, this big question about sort of what do social scientists do in policy making? How do social scientists influence policy? Um, and in particular, what I want to argue is that this literature has largely ignored the role of social scientific description. Most of the work is about other kinds of social scientific claims, practices, et cetera. And we've spent a lot less time than we maybe ought to have looking at descriptive work. And to make sense of that, I want to back up and, and, and sort of just try to break down the kinds of work that social scientists do a little bit more. And this is super coarse, but hopefully useful. Um, so when we think about the kinds of claims that social scientists make, the sorts of arguments they put forward, um, I want to argue we can think of this as a kind of two by two table. Um, this is sort of like a, a trope of sociology, and so it's almost like an in joke at this point. Um, I'm looking at the sociologists in the room for the knowing laughs. Uh, so we can break this down into kind of a two by two table. And we can think of claims um, as sort of being uh, narrower or broader in scope. How much of time or history or space do they cover? We can think of them as being sort of descriptive or causal. That is, are they claims about what the world looks like or the claims about how the world moves. And uh, in the sort of narrow and descriptive category, I think we're very comfortable with things coming out of, say, ethnographic research. Think about Geertz and think thick description. Think about going into a field site and really laying out very clearly what, how this particular space feels, moves, look like. You know, describing very thickly a particular context. Um, on the sort of narrow and causal end, you have this sort of current love for experiments in particular. There's been a huge rise in experimental research in the social sciences, whether it's um, you know, randomized controlled trials in development economics or survey experiments. Um, psychology's obviously been doing experiments for a lot longer and a lot more forcefully. Um, but here you have the idea that we're gonna tightly control the situation um, and experimentally manipulate one variable in particular to sort of be able to pin down exactly why a particular outcome occurred the way it did. We can really get sort of traction on causality in a, a, a sort of narrow context. Um, at the broad and causal level, we have what you might call big theory or grand theory. Um, this is where a lot of the work's been on the role of economists. So think about here like neoliberalism, monetarism, Keynesianism, big paradigms that tell you how lots and lots of parts of the world move. Um, they're, they're causal explanatory theories um, and they're intended to cover um, broad swaths of time and space. Um, and you know, many of these have been hugely influential and there's lots of great research sort of tracking how the rise and fall of different say, paradigms in the social sciences, particularly in economics, has led to changes in policy making and things like this. What I want to argue has been sort of missed is the, is the sort of possibility of influence of broad descriptive claims and particularly broad descriptive claims in kind of the quantitative jargon. And so here, stylized facts would be one example of a kind of broad descriptive claim. Um, you might think of them as sort of thin description. Um, that is to say that they are not sort of telling you a lot about any particular moment or time or place, but they're covering a pretty broad range and sort of summarizing a lot of information together. Um, and so I want to argue that we, should, we would benefit from spending a little more time thinking about the role of this kind of description in sort of public and political life as well <coughs> as in academic social science. And so to give a more sort of concrete definition, um, I'm gonna argue we can think of stylized facts as an, an empirical regularity in need of an explanation. So this is something that we see recurring in the world across relatively broad time and space, um, but that isn't already well explained. That is something that's worth our time to try to come up with a causal explanation for it. Uh, so I'll give you a few examples of the kinds of things you see in the social sciences. Um, I can sort of see them falling into three broad patterns, so I don't wanna say that are, that's all the possibilities there are. You can think of claims of correlation, that two variables move together regularly. And so here you have a classic claim from the political science uh, literature, um, democracies rarely go to war with one another. It's a so-called democratic peace claim. Um, you can think of trends. So this is uh, how a variable is moving over time. Uh, so here you have something like the share of profits going to finance has risen dramatically. This is the claim of what's called financialization in economic sociology and other places. Um, and you can think about things like rates of incidence. 
Um, you can also think of this as like a sort of non-association with time. That's sort of like a stable uh, way that things uh, are distributed in the world. And so, for example, the famous claim that one in 10 people are gay, um, which is sort of uh, a number that derives itself as a really interesting history, uh, is a sort of misreading of Kinsey's research and a kind of blurring together of categories and numbers, um, but comes very used, uh, used, deployed by activists in the mid 20th century to make claims about civil rights. Um, and so we have sort of three different classes or kinds of stylized facts, and they share a bunch of things in common. Uh, one is they're all explicitly not causal. They're not telling you why one in people are gay or why democracy is really going to war with one another. They're just sort of pointing <coughs> out that it seems to be the case for large periods of time or across lots of space that uh, these trends happen. There are also explicitly sort of demands on researcher attention. So one of the ways stylized facts are normative, and there's lots of ways that facts are normative, and we have all sorts of great uh, theorizing and thinking about the in, it's sort of imbrications of facts and values. But one of the ways that these particular facts uh, build in a kind of value component is that they're sort of normative demand. They're saying not just is this a correlation that exists, but it's one that's worth paying attention to. It's something puzzling or interesting or important to, to, to sort of note. And last, um, they, these uh, stylized facts, these examples, and there are lots of others, tend to be framed in terminology that is simultaneously technical and non-technical. And what I mean by this is that each of these kind of the key terms in each of these example stylized facts, things like democracy, war, profits, finance, gay, even people in some sense, are technical terms. They're linked back to particular data sets, particular oper operationalizations, particular measures, right? What it means to go to war in the correlates of war data set is a particular choice about how you measure deaths and violence and how you operationalize that into a binary variable, war or not. Similarly, what it means to be a democracy is an operational choice. You have to look at various kinds of measures of elections and, and so on and so forth, and you use that to determine what counts for these purposes as a democracy. Um, but those terms, of course, also have widespread use. They're not terms that we as social scientists have control over. And so when a social scientist makes a claim, like democracies rarely go to war with one another, that claim can travel out into the world somewhat disconnected from the particular operationalization of the variables, the particular meaning the social scientist meant and attached to them, the particular data that, that sort of uh, justified the claim. So it travels out and does other kinds of work. Um, and you see this a lot in the gender wage gap example. Um, what people mean by earnings, what people mean by sort of um, the gap between those things uh, has, a, has a relatively clear meaning in sort of economics and sociology, um, but a sort of a more diffuse set of meanings once it travels out and meets up with um, particularly sort of uh, legal definitions of discrimination that have in mind a very different kind of object. And so stylized facts in particular, in general, uh, have this kind of simultaneously technical and non-technical character. They're about things we care about. They're making claims about how those things move or are related to each other um, over time. Um, they say we need to understand why this is happening. But they're also, like, I think, uh, primed to be misunderstood or creatively reinterpreted or, or applied in different contexts. Um, so I'll give you a brief history of their use. Um, this is not my term. I should make that super clear. Um, this is a term that comes out of economics proper as it's grappling with itself and trying to figure out what it's doing. Um, and so um, in the 1950s, uh, you start seeing the first discussions of stylized facts in economics. And this comes out of particularly uh, macroeconomics. And this is sort of as macroeconomics is becoming a sort of quantitative empirical subject as well as a theoretical one. Uh, you sort of have the emergence of national income statistics, GNP, GDP, you have measurements of unemployment rates, and you have the sort of the starting place of sort of quantitative conversations about things like economic growth. In the 1950s, an economist named Caldor identified six uh, regularities that he said roughly obtain for all the time periods they had measurements for, at least, in the various countries they had data about. The most famous of those facts was this idea that the share of national income received by labor and capital are roughly constant over long periods of time, so-called labor's share, like the amount of money going to workers versus the amount of money going to capitalists. These stayed in rough, roughly the same over long periods of time. And these six facts become the sort of first officially identified stylized facts a couple of years later. And their, their usage kind of picks up in economics over time. Um, and so, in, and that sort of spreads out in sociology and political science a little bit later. You can really see that if you actually look at, say, JSTOR data. This is the database of all articles in J, JSTOR. Um, you can see the explicit use of the term stylized facts really takes off in the 1980s. 
such that by the 2000s, you're seeing a few hundred articles a year that use the term in JSTOR. Um, and at this point, more than 1% of all economics articles published in this period use the term. So it's not my term, this is a term that economists themselves are using all the time, but they're not really reflecting about it. There are no papers in the literature on like what a stylized fact is, or how you make up a good one, or how you know when you found one. Um, it's just sort of like a, a term of art that's sort of used in practice. Um, I want to argue though that this idea of thinking about sort of rough empirical uh, regularities that need to be explained is actually much older and more pervasive than just sort of its use in primarily economics. Um, if you look back at, for example, um, Max Weber's Protestant Ethic, a book I teach every fall in classical social theory, um, the first pages actually open with uh, a claim about sort of a regularity observed between Protestant and Catholic uh, rates of entrepreneurship, what we now say. And so Max Weber is going to make this big, sweeping historical argument using kind of interpretive data about the role of religion in economic life, but he starts with this. A glance at the occupational statistics of any country of mixed religious composition brings to light with remarkable frequency a situation which has several times provoked discussion in the Catholic press and literature and in Catholic congresses in Germany, namely the fact that business leaders and owners of capital, as well as the higher grades of skilled labor, uh, et cetera, et cetera, are overwhelmingly Protestant. Right? So here we have this idea, there's a sort of a rough correlation that's remarkably regular and frequent uh, between being Protestant and being a skilled tradesman or a business leader. And conversely, between being Catholic and not being one of those things. And so uh, Weber is not going to run a bunch of regressions to figure out exactly what the correlates are of being a business leader or a skilled laborer. But he is going to sort of use this observed regularity to motivate a historical inquiry about the relationship between religion and economic life. And so I think um, this idea of, of sort of opening up with these kinds of stylized facts and then using them as justification for a larger research project is super common across the social sciences um, and maybe even beyond that a little bit. Um, and so thinking about this more precisely, if we're trying to figure out like what stylized facts are doing, like we can sort of think about it, what they're doing academically, what they're doing politically, and what they're doing connecting the two together. And so within academia, within the social sciences, what I see stylized facts doing is sort of taking the place of phenomena. So if you go to folks like uh, philosophers of science like Ian Hacking or Bogan and Woodward, there's some different senses of the word phenomenon, but they, they roughly cluster around this idea that natural scientists can do things to the world in ways that sort of produce routine results. They can push the world certain ways, the world pushes back. Uh, maybe those, results, those, are, those pushes can be observational. We measure the same thing over and over again with the same telescope and get the same result. And we identify certain phenomena. And there's a sort of model of progress in science you get out of that literature that suggests that science sort of proceeds by identifying new phenomena and then sort of coming up with theories to how to figure out why those phenomena are the way they are. You identify the photoelectric effect and you come up with new theories of light to explain why it happens. Um, social scientists don't really have <coughs> phenomena very often, or at least we don't work in a world that is amenable to being manipulated that way that often. Um, more often we have these sort of quasi-regularities. We have um, statistical trends that hold for long enough that it seems like it's worth bothering trying to model and explain them. And so something like the gender wage gap, you know, it persists year to year. It's been trending a little bit, you know, towards um, equality, although it's mostly stalled out in the last couple decades. Um, but it's something that's big enough and stable enough that one can think about producing a kind of model to explain it. And this is exactly what economists do. So if you read the first paragraph or two of an econ paper, especially say like a macroeconomics paper, you'll often find it saying, you know, we create a model that reproduces these stylized facts. Why is there a, you know, a premium on large firms in this space? Well, we're going to come up with a particular model that sort of explains why that fact happens. And so they're quite explicitly used as sort of the things to be explained by uh, either sort of formal models in the economist's world or less formal models in sociology or political science. Um, and the reason that sort of economists have occasionally, when they've, when they've reflected at all on this practice, um, one of the things they emphasize is that stylized facts are useful as a kind of handoff between the empiricists and the theorists. In the sense that um, the empirical data is always super noisy. Uh, there's always little jitters and movements and all of our measurement tools are imperfect and you need some way to extract kind of a signal out of that noisy data, that's the, the thing that is sort of stable enough to be worth coming up with theories about, something that's almost like structural in some way, even if it's gonna change over time, but it's at least close enough to a regularity to be worth trying to theorize about. And so you do this work of abstracting away some of the noise to get that kind of signal, like the idea that 
labor share of income is roughly constant. If you look at the data underlying that claim, it bounces around between 70% and 75% year to year. But what uh, Nicholas Calder thought was interesting was not that it bounced around between 70 and 75 percent, but that it was roughly in that same range for decades at a time across different countries. And so the idea here is that stylized facts um, are a next best thing. We don't have a world that's stable enough and unchanging enough to imagine we're going to identify phenomena that are sort of transhistorically true, but we've got things that are true enough for long enough to be worth modeling. At the same time, these stylized facts travel out. And we already sort of saw that in the opening sort of vignette about the gender pay gap. Um, and they get yoked to particular claims, often connected to what I'm going to call folk causal theories. Um, these may or may not line up with academic theories, but the point is they're, they're theories about why the stylized fact is that may or may not be connected to what economists or sociologists or social scientists think about that particular fact. And so the, a number that sociologists or economists might explain one way may travel out and get connected to political claims that um, are, are disconnected from that particular explanation. Um, you can also see the way that stylized facts sort of shape social identities. So one of the chapters of the project looks at the uh, recent discussions of the 1% and sort of the rise of narrative about top income and top income inequality. And the sort of flip side of the 1%, of course, is the claim from Occupy Wall Street that we are the 99%. Right, you have this whole social movement that's sort of defining itself statistically in contrast to this sort of newly identified group of rich people whose wealth is sort of seen as, as, as dramatically increasing. And so there's a way in which kind of the statistical framing of um, particular facts about something like inequality can in turn sort of shape or reconstitute social identities, or you see it with sort of like the calendar example, right? We're gonna, we're gonna identify dates on the calendar. We can peg the gender wage gap to, to create equal paydays around which we're gonna mobilize those sorts of information campaigns, advocacy campaigns, and so on. Um, and then finally, stylized facts can act as this kind of hinge, right? Because they're sort of rhetorically useful to social movements and academically useful to social scientists, they end up being a place where these two things come together, albeit not necessarily perfectly or with some miscommunications on both sides. And so you see social scientists popping up in stories about policy proposals or about social movement advocacy because they're using some of the same terminology. They're invoking some of the same descriptions of the world, whether or not they're coming at it from the same sort of explanatory frameworks. Um, a point of clarification. Um, I've given this talks about this topic a few times, and I realize that like the concept is not obvious at all, um, even to me entirely, uh, like particularly what its boundaries are. And so it might be useful to think about a couple things that are not stylized facts, things that might just be facts or other kinds of facts, if we were to sort of broaden out our uh, set of uh, descriptive terms for what kinds of facts there are in the world. Um, so particularly, some things that aren't stylized facts, a specific data point that's not claimed to be a regularity over time and space, so for example, if you say um, the US unemployment rate is 4% this month, um, that's not particularly a stylized fact, unless you're trying to turn it into some claim about some kind of regularity across uh, a larger time and space. Obviously, these things are somewhat blurry, uh, and there's one about sort of the intentionality of the claim as much as the number itself. Um, but that's, you know, it's one thing to say, um, in contrast, something like the unemployment rate for white Americans is typically about half that of black Americans, uh, which claim that is roughly true. Um, this would be a stylized fact claim because it's something that's sort of claiming sort of breadth in time and space for when it applies. Uh, anything that sort of has a causal claim associated with it, um, so not just associational irregularity, not just about sort of when two things co-occur, but explaining one causes the other, that is also not a stylized fact. Again, often the point of creating a stylized fact is then to move on to do causal research. Um, it's to give you something to explain or to sort of give something we have consensus about to be explained. Um, an example of this from a recent blog post that I find kind of hilarious. Um, this is from a, a, a conservative uh, family demographer sociologist, Mark Ardenaris. He writes, uh, young adult men's support for same-sex marriage may not be entirely the product of ideals about expansive freedoms, rights, and liberties, and fairness. It may be in part a byproduct of regular exposure to diverse and graphic sex acts. This is a post from a family demographer arguing that porn viewership, porn viewing causes support for same-sex marriage. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so this would be a good example of something that is not a stylized fact because it's a claim about causality. Um, the claim underlying it that's probably true is that there's an association between porn viewership and supporting same-sex marriage. Um, there's no particular evidence in, the, uh, in any of the work that he did that there's anything causal there, but he makes the causal claim. Um, so that's the sort of distinction between those two styles of claims. Um, so another thing worth, worth noting is that not all stylized facts claims succeed. Um, there's a couple different ways they can fail. 
One is they can just fail to get any attention. So you can say, this needs to be explained, and everyone else can say, eh, no, it doesn't. Move on. We have other things to care about. Uh, and others, people can then can dispute the stylized fact and say, you're wrong. You've gotten the math wrong. So for example, with the sort of the 1% claim, the claim from Kedi and Saez, that uh, the incomes of the top 1% had risen dramatically over the last 30 or 40 years, um, there's an immediate pushback from conservative economists saying, no, you're actually just mismeasuring the, the data because you've not understood the tax code changes correctly. And there's kind of like a 10 year back and forth about whether or not their sort of their rough gloss of the data was accurate or misleading. Uh, in that case, Piketty and Saez sort of went out in the end, and most economists and sociologists and policymakers and the public at large kind of adopt that framing. Um, but lots of other stylized facts, people will advance them, and they'll get critiqued, and they'll fall apart. Um, and so economists have this jokey phrase that something can be, quote, more stylized than fact. Um, in particular, um, that claim about the sort of constant share of labor's, uh, labor share in national income that goes back to the 1950s, um, that was roughly true until about the 1990s, and then it breaks down dramatically. And in the last 20 years, as income inequality has increased, uh, labor share of national income has gone down significantly. And so that stylized fact no longer seems to hold. Um, lots of different ways we can study these things. Um, this is sort of about the larger product I'm working on. Uh, one of the things I do a lot of is just sort of tracing these linkages, attending to misunderstandings, and particularly looking for sort of like meaningful silences. Sort of you can tell when these things don't exist, which is super interesting. So each of the stylized facts I looked at, like the gender wage gap and the 1%, there's a moment in history where people are having debates about the same topic and those numbers aren't present. And so you can kind of get some handle on what changes when they start talking about things that way. So for example, with the gender wage gap, um, there are very, there's no discussion of something like the modern gender wage gap until the 1960s. And so if you go back to the 1950s or 1940s, the debates are about usually within occupation. So let's say men teachers are getting paid more than women teachers, or et cetera. Or there are debates about occupational segregation. Women aren't being allowed to work as lawyers, as doctors, et cetera. Um, but this idea of looking sort of economy-wide um, at the sort of breadth doesn't really exist until the 1960s. And it emerges in tandem with a particularly narrow kind of legal mobilization around the Equal Pay Act, which bans only discrimination for uh, different work for the exact same job which was sort of like a partial compromise with the feminist movement that had strove for a much more expansive uh, anti-discrimination law that banned uh, unequal pay for work of comparable value that didn't ever go anywhere. And so there's like a sort of a, a really interesting history of the back and forth between those things. Um, and so the three chapters in the project I'm looking at look at the gender page gap, the 1%, and the racial wealth gap, which is another interesting example of a, a stylized fact that doesn't quite make it. We're starting to see it now, um, but the racial wealth gap sort of um, you go back and look at sort of major discussions of racial inequality in the 20th century, and it's mostly not there. Researchers try to start pushing it, but if you look at things like the Kerner Commission report or the Murdahl report, wealth is just absent. And it's only really in the last like 10 years that a group of economists have sort of gotten, sociologists have sort of gotten the racial wealth gap more on the agenda, linking it up to reparations debate, things like that. Um, so this is the kind of product I'm engaged in, um, and the kind of broad takeaways are, are just that first, social scientific description matters. Um, I think we need to care more about it. I think social scientists, if they want to be influential, should care about it because it's a great way to be influential. But I also think as sort of sociologists and, and science studies scholars and historians, um, it's worth thinking about how social scientists are describing the world and what kind of influence that has, rather than focusing on just the kind of big theories, say. Um, stylized facts that circulate within academia as sort of phenomenon model, model, and they travel sort of outside, connecting academic and political conversations. Um, but successfully circulating one of these things requires a fair bit of work. Um, it's not the case that you can just sort of do the calculation once, publish it in a paper somewhere, and then all of a sudden you've changed the conversation. But rather, the numbers that have succeeded have usually been connected to kind of larger social movements or kind of um, activist efforts by scholars. Um, and then these stylized facts kind of join up with uh, various understandings that may or may not be linked back to the social sciences uh, that kind of shape how political claims get mobilized. Um, and then finally, um, back to the gender wage gap example, and this shows another context as well, um, social scientists have this question, controlling for what? When you run a statistical model, you ask, okay, the relationship between A and B, but what have you controlled for? And this is often treated as a methodological or technical question, but it's really a deeply political one as well. And so when you ask, why is the gender wage gap framed in terms of full-time work, for example? We know that women are much less likely to work full-time than men because they're much more likely to have other obligations, um, but yet we control for full-time work. Why isn't it controlling for age? Uh, why isn't it controlling for all these other things, for actual hours worked, right? The particular number we choose to emphasize 
uh, is always going to capture some features and not others. And there's no right choice, but each one of those choices sort of has political consequences and ramifications, especially when you know a number is going to travel out and potentially get sort of interpreted in light of a different mental model of what's already been controlled for. Um, and the last thing I'll end on is an example from that I sometimes use for teaching. Um, is a claim that gets made, for example, that um, immigrants commit fewer crimes than native-born Americans. There's also a claim that gets made that immigrants commit more crimes than native-born Americans. And the answer to that question depends on what you've controlled for. Right? If you control for gender, uh, immigrants more likely be men. If you control for education, if you control for race, what does that even mean in this context, right? Those questions don't have obvious answers. Um, but which one you report out, what variables you've controlled for, radically shapes the discourse that hears something in particular when you say the words immigrants commit more crimes or fewer crimes. So in that sense, controlling for what in this kind of descriptive context matters a lot. But we don't really have any good way of talking about it because we don't think about just social scientific description as like an independently important thing, and I think we ought to. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, the floor is open. You can ask either of the speakers or both of them. You're there. Hi. So I have a question for uh, Stephanie. Thank you for a great talk. Um, so I think the police example is very uh, interesting, but it seems a bit problematic to start the story in the 1950s because if you think of the origin of the police in Britain and in, in the US, for example, the origin is in colonialism and counterinsurgency strategies and uh, uh, strike breaking and of course in the US in, in catching um, uh, runaway uh, uh, slaves. Um, so it, it seems to, many people have argued, and I think this is right, the police is not about crime, it's about, the police are, are about managing uh, racial and economic inequality. So it seems that you know, by the time a person is up for sentencing in the US, it, it's all over, right? There's no, there's no way to correct that uh, you know, bias, if you want to call it that. So I'm wondering if maybe framing it as a data problem is problematic at the core. And, and also the question is, how, how does the framing, you're, you're suggesting a move to an archive. What I'm having trouble seeing is how, how that would get at that question. If the police is structurally not about crime, then, then how would the move from data to an archive or, you know, help resolve that? Yeah, great. I mean, of course, you're absolutely right about this. And I partly chose the criminal justice cases because they are inherently problematic. Whereas if instead I've been talking about data collection in mathematics, which is you know, the other side of the study, that's less obvious. Um, so part of what inspired me to want to connect this back to the archival question is the way that, and all of what I know about this, I've learned from Beth Yale, who's a historian of the archive, archivists are in this moment reckoning with the colonialism of the archive. Um, they, as humanists, are interrogating the question of how has the way that history has been written been shaped by the way that we have collected documents, stored documents, what's been lost, um, what would be some humanist tactics for decolonizing the archive, uh, both in terms of who has access to it and in terms of what possible histories can be written by it. Um, and I thought, it, what we need for data science is that particular kind of reckoning and also training. Um, I actually am sort of literal about it that I think data scientists ought to go to information schools and learn what archivists are doing currently, theorizing their own sort of data and its colonial history. Um, so yes, of course, policing is inherently problematic and I kind of I wanted, um, you know, I'm, I'm simultaneously romanticizing a kind of 50s and 60s vision of data because it has a connection to libraries and archives and filing systems that have a more human agency built into them, but they are, of course, also control systems and have always been so. Um, data record keeping is about eugenics, it's about slavery, it's about incarceration, um, and I'm not so sure you can ever get around that problem uh, without dismantling the carceral state, which I'm all for that, of course, as well, uh, but I, I prefer the 1950s and 60s vision of police databasing because it has a humanist discourse attached to it um, and because I see in it the possibility for the kind of reckoning that archivists are bringing to their own practice right now that is completely absent from um, other conversations about data except insofar as people have finally noticed that data collection can you know, reinforce and reproduce racial bias and inequality, which of course it does. But yes, and of course, thank you. <laughs>
Um, thanks so much. I have a question, Stephanie, for you also, um, which goes to something you said just a minute ago. Um, I wonder whether the epistemic or epistemological collapse that you described is, is less about the erasure or loss of human agency and more about a shift in where the agency is found, a, a shift away from the individual uh, individual human agent to more collectivized, power-laden, uh, you know, cons where, or sites where, where human agency and power are consolidated at larger scales in companies, in government agencies, and so on, and, uh, and oriented to a very kind of explicit purpose of control of uh, human populations. So not so much a loss of agency or erasure of agency, but just those footprints, you know, are somewhere else, but there's still, there's still human agency in this picture. I wonder what you think about that. Sure, yeah. I mean, if we want to, um, if we want to say it's no longer individual people querying a database, it is the corporation of, of Google, who has agency, and the people working within it, I think that's right. <laughs> um, and I mean, people, people at institutions, the, the so-called data monopolies, there are seven of them, you know, depending on how you count, uh, who have the power and the infrastructure in place to collect more data than anyone else, um, get to decide what they want to make predictions about. So they get to, you know, and most of that predictive work is being done to predict what people want to buy. Um, so, so someone is making that decision and that's a profit-oriented choice. Um, but the, I think the, the idea of, still the idea of building databases that could accommodate a, an epistemologically flexible imagined user that might ask a different question is still a problem when predictive accuracy is the only thing that you're collecting data and training on it to build systems to do. So you can, you can decide what prediction you want to make whether you care about elections or purchases or um, who's likely to graduate from college or whatever, um, you can choose different predictions. Google can choose to predict whatever it wants with its data, but if what you want is something other than a prediction, that capability has sort of been reduced in the machine learning model. And I'm really grateful to Dan because um, I ran out of time, but I was gonna say usually what's held up as the epistemological other of uh, predictive accuracy is causal explanatory knowledge. The debate in the sciences is I don't care, this is a sort of Noam Chomskyism. He, at the 150th anniversary of MIT, did a whole spiel against machine learning and said, I actually just don't care if you can predict with perfect accuracy, you know, when the bees are gonna migrate. If you can't tell me why the bees are migrating, um, he advocated the study of sort of underlying causal laws and mechanisms um, to which some of the machine learning practitioners re responded, you know, what hubris. <laughs> sort of this whole obsession we have with causal law-based knowledge might just be hubris. All there is in the world, sort of in line with the social scientist view, are correlations and patterns. Let's find those, let's make predictions, it's our best knowledge. So I'm trying to offer the flexibility of epistemological question that archives and libraries offer um, is neither causal or law-based, nor is it predictively oriented. Um, and so even if you're the powerful person in the position to decide what to predict, we still think there's a constraint um, around what kinds of questions can be asked, if that makes sense. <clears throat> um, this is actually a question for Dan. Um, th those were such fantastic talks, and I wish you hadn't said the standards so high right from the beginning. But, uh, Dan, um, so I'm super taken with your category of analysis, so my question then is a kind of historian's one about that category. I'll state the question and then kind of give some logic about the question in the next bit. But, in what kinds of political or social conditions do stylized facts proliferate? So not particular facts, um, but are there times when the very category becomes larger or smaller? And what would the conditions for that be? And then the question comes out of a realization that, you know, what you're calling stylized facts were called statistical regularities in the 19th century. Mm, Parisians are more likely to commit suicide statistically than Londoners. Uh, there's a standard proportion of letters in the dead letter office. The dead letter office, of course, as we know from Bartleby, everyone's obsessed by it. 
Um, but there becomes a panic, of course, as you know about this in the 19th century. It's statistical determinism becomes a thing. People panic about free will. If 3% of people are going to commit suicide every year, should you go to hell for committing suicide if you never had a choice, etc., etc. So there's this kind of real discussion about these statistical regularities that, that explodes and then shrinks again. I think Durkheim brings it up again and it kind of, they seem to go in and out. Um, so kind of one historical question is, are there stylized facts before statistics? Is there a version that's non-numerical, right? Um, how much of this has to do with formal social sciences? Kekele is an astronomer, right? Um, and, you know, what, what are the conditions under which they might expand or shrink? That's a great question. Um, thanks so much. I think, um, maybe I'll take the last part first with thinking about just the last 20 years. Yeah. So I'm um, not a 19th century historian, but I do mostly 20th century <coughs> US. Um, but thinking about um, what's changed in kind of like the advocacy, politics, media landscape in just you know, my lifetime. Um, the rise of data journalism and data visualization has been a clear like moment when sort of new ways of doing description have become influential. Um, and so you see, for example, um, economists who really had poo-pooed description for a long time and kind of not really talked about it much, uh, and still mostly work in that mode, but you see much more, partly through the connections to machine learning, um, even though machine learning is more about prediction than description, there's, some, there's like a, a fuzzier boundary in some ways. And so you see a lot more work, I think, on visualization and on um, like doing fancy stuff with big data sets to produce pretty maps and things and pretty correlations. And so like um, Raj Chetty's whole career, he publishes, it's a New York Times article every month about some new paper he's written with a fancy gorgeous visualization. And that's, that's something distinctive and new. Social scientists sort of pipeline to the public sphere has changed a lot in the last 50 years, sort of before think tanks, during think tanks, and then kind of this sort of new thing happening. I think that's really changed the way at least academic social scientists' productions of stylized facts have been able to circulate. Um, a local example, um, a group of economists, including Chetty and um, a guy named Friedman here at Brown, published this fantastic data about what percentage of US colleges have more students whose parents come from the top 1% of income brackets than from the bottom 60%, right? And Brown is, of course, one of, one of the you know, just on this list, as are most of the Ivy League. And that got tremendous traction. It's just a, basically a correlation. They had to get together a lot of data from IRS, et cetera, put it together, but it got you know, massively picked up by all the mainstream media sources and, and so on. So I think that we've seen in just the last 10-ish years um, a, a sort of rearrangement of things that's made it more possible for social scientists in particular to do the work themselves of getting certain numbers out in the world because there's a lot more sort of like statistically literate journalists hungry for stories like that. Um, that's just one piece of this and what your question points to really nicely is that um, social scientists don't have a monopoly, monopoly on statistical analysis and nor is that, uh, and in some ways statistical analysis predates the modern social sciences, right? Um, they're, they're born more in the late 19th century and there was already conversations happening in the 1820s or whenever. I think it's a great question. I haven't thought enough about and don't know enough about the sort of political world of the first half of the 19th century to want to speculate too much. I think that's a great set of prompts and questions. Um, so I do think there are conditions under which these, these things come into play more or less. And it's connected to ideas like statistical determinism or the one I think about a lot, um, sort of the modern concept that fits in the same space I think a lot about um, is this idea of abstract liberalism which is a phrase that comes out of the literature and sociology of race, about how um, Americans in particular, but not only, had this tendency to attribute outcomes to individual effort, right? And in particularly with any narrative around race and racial inequality, right, any claim about, around racial inequality is sort of met with a claim about individual choices, decision-making skills, et cetera. And there's a sense in which um, statistical uh, information often conflicts with or has to be reinterpreted in the light of. And so the debate about the gender wage gap, for example, is all about, is this women's choices, right? Is it just that women are choosing to opt out of the workforce and be mothers, and that's what's accounting for all of this, or is it discrimination? Is it the choices of sexist managers, et cetera, right? And so like, the framing of choice um, totally structures the public conversation around a lot of these stylized facts, in this moment at least. And so I think there is something about the way those conversations are inflected through those larger ideas that is obviously very different in different moments of time. So that's a great question, thank you. Um, thanks. It's, this is a question for Stephanie and a uh, really terrific paper, Stephanie. Thanks. And, and it made me think along, along three lines. And the first was 
thinking, where does the desire for predictability come from, right? And so on the one hand, you're talking about a development of an epistemology of the database, but it seems like there's also a parallel history of the securitization of law enforcement, such that law enforcement now comes to be about security rather than safety, and the way in which preemption is at the heart of a securitized mindset, you know, as Joe Masco, for instance, talks about. So then the second thing I was thinking is where does the desire for predictability come from with the emphasis on the where and wondering, and, and I don't mean this is criticism at all, wondering about the Americanness of your story, right? Because when I think about, for instance, any higher judicial conversation on prison law enforcement incarceration in South Africa, for instance, today, it's humanistic and constitutional, right? And the conversation is around dignity. So it's striking that even the constitutionalized version of American law enforcement that you were talking about discusses racism in terms of fairness and not dignity, for instance, right? And so, so I'm wondering what the conceptual implications are of thinking your story as one of the co-production of epistemological developments with political legal cultures, which might have developed otherwise in other places. And then the third thing, then it leads me to think of the work of Julia Hornberger, who is an anthropologist at the University of Witwatersrand. Very different kind of project, but she's working on the global circulation of what are called fake or counterfeit drugs. And one of the things that she's tracing is how this has become securitized at the level of transnational governance, such that the WHO, WTO, and Interpol are all coming together to make the counterfeit drug a sort of object of attention and intervention. And African countries that have followed in this way, way very aggressively are Nigeria and Tanzania. And this is very different from South Africa's safety first approach, which is a kind of old fashioned, you know, the, the, the worry that a counterfeit drug is dangerous because it's a risk to public safety. It's very different from this sort of new securitized mindset, but what that leads to in the South African conversation is this constant anxiety on the part of South African law enforcement that it's falling short of international US-derived law enforcement regimes that are more securitized. So I'm wondering about the implications of thinking of your story as a US story in the context of a global <coughs> geopolitics that's underwritten by American imaginations of law enforcement, which means that what's at stake is that the story that you're telling is not just at odds with the previous constitutional history of the US, but also at odds with other constitutional presence in other parts of the world that are now being overwritten by this. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, this, is, this is wonderful and helpful and uh, powerful. Um, so I knew, I, knew I, was, I knew I was at risk, well not at risk, I knew I was guilty of, of sort of holding up database practices in the 1950s and 60s, you know, in the middle of the war on crime and the civil rights movement and the Cold War is somehow some humanist bastion for databasing practices when um, uh, this is, of course, not the right way to look at that moment. But what's really helpful and important in what you said is to identify what others to focus on. And I, I, love, I love this point about how different incarceration looks like, or debates about incarceration look like if dignity was the question, as opposed to fairness or privacy, uh, which are such American formulations. Um, and one of the things, I, I, have nothing, I have nothing to add, except, except um, the added insight that part of what all automation does, all automation entrenches current meanings of categories. Um, and some of those categories desperately need to be broken apart. But in order to have a successful machine learning system or you know, more traditional database for law enforcement, you need really clear definitions of what counts as a criminal act, what counts as a conviction, what counts as X, Y, and Z um, to feed into the system. And by defining them in the beginning to produce an automated system, I think we forfeit another kind of agency, which is our ability to tear concepts apart completely rather than entrenching them and then hiding them in our automated systems. Um, and I do think what America needs is a reckoning with its entire carceral infrastructure. Um, but I think that is becoming increasingly impossible as we build 
definitions of things into automated systems that are increasingly unpenetrable or interpretable to us. Um, so I will just say thank, thank you and yes. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so two great talks. Thank you. Uh, I have uh, a question for both speakers. So the first one's for Dan. And it's sort of, uh, I don't know if it's a follow-up or maybe a restatement of Suman's question, but um, <clears throat> whether for you stylized facts have become the stylized fact, so um, um, what we can learn about the history of the social sciences and maybe um, the character of social debate in general from the kind of waxing and waning of the description in both technical and public discourse and how they um, circulate from one context to the other. Um, and then the other, the question for Stephanie has to do with <clears throat> um, kind of what, what it is or where it is that the political is hiding in machine learning algorithms. And it struck me there's kind of two, at least perhaps two aspects of machine learning that um, make the political work of these algorithms opaque. One of them is their inscrutability, um, that, um, I forget the technical term that you used, but um, that there, that, you know, there's so many, the parameterization is so complex that we, the human mind can't make sense of them, and so we can't kind of, induct, they're, they're a kind of classic black box, we can't look inside of them. <clears throat> Whereas the others might, the other uh, place where uh, politics might be hiding is in their claim to objectivity and their and it struck me that both of those are not new to machine learning in any sense. Bureaucracies are famously inscrutable. Um, um, all sorts of um, um, institutions of social political power are often inscrutable. The Supreme Court uh, is an inscrutable institution, so on and so forth. Um, and of course, objectivity is not new either. And so I'm wondering if what's kind of, A, what's maybe interestingly different about machine learning is that it's not either of these elements, but they're a combination, the way that they work together. And then E, what that might mean for creating an alternative, what you're describing as a more humanistic archival practice that not only involves a kind of explicit engagement with the politics of archival practices, but also, therefore, it strikes me, would also require a kind of public engagement. So not just a, um, a kind of claim to archival expertise or humanistic archival expertise, but a sort of open discussion of our battle practices um, uh, or mechanisms of social control or something like that. I'm not, I'm not sure I totally know what the question you're asking is, but other than just to say, like, I think you're asking it like, if it's worth thinking about, um, rather than thinking about particular political debates and how a particular fact enters or leaves that debate and changes it, thinking about sort of periods of history and their overall, like, the role of numbers in political debates or academic debates at those times, like thinking more like periods of quantification rather than uh, how a particular form of quantification changes a particular debate. Um, so it's not the way I've been thinking, like I've been tracing each of these facts in their own sort of, like the history of debates around women and work and inequality from the 1920s to present, the history of debates around reparations and wealth and race in the US from 1950s to present, looking kind of that way. And so I haven't been looking like at slices of time to ask, what are numbers doing in general in political debate in the 1950s versus the 1970s? Is that what you're asking? I, it just, it struck me, I mean, um, just when you showed that, um, like the JSTOR yeah. chart, yeah. that, you know, the career of the stylized fact is itself a stylized oh, yeah, fact yeah. about yes. the history of social sciences. Yes. And so what can we learn? Like, if stylized facts are facts in need of in search of an explanation, then the question is, is that what your, is that what your project is? Right. Is explaining the, the stylized fact? Yeah. So right now it's just describing it. Uh, maybe I'll explain it at some point. But uh, it's describing it and, and showing how it, how it can move. Um, and, and in particular, I mean, for me, there's a, there's a, there's a super practical implication, which is that um, sociologists and economists are taught not to do descriptive work, that it's like table one in a real paper, but it's not the real paper. And I think that's a huge mistake because it trains us not to do description well. And also, like, it, it gets rid of one of our best weapons. And so I actually, sort of inspired by having started this work, wrote a descriptive quantitative paper with, with a, a colleague about higher ed stuff, another project. Um, and it was very successful. And um, it was a weird thing, because no one ever trained me, like, okay, how does one best describe this data set, and how does one do that most usefully for a particular debate that's happening? And I think, so, um, to me, that's the current payoff. 
Um, I could imagine there being a, uh, another payoff the way you're talking about as well, but for the moment, I just want to sort of figure out what these things are doing and then how to take advantage of them. Um, yeah, thanks, Lucas. Um, so, of course, all over the place, machine learning is being held up as, you know, data-driven, objective, uh, actually the best predictions we've ever been able to make in the world. Um, and it gains, you know, its power, which is of course political power to, to shape the future, um, is, is grounded in this claim to objectivity and our colleagues have already sort of done their job dismantling that category or, or showing how it's how it operates differently. I, I, we, are wait, we await, you know, the, the chapter four of objectivity that's about, you know, predictive objectivity or something in addition to the other three. Um, and, and I'm glad you, you raised also this question of inscrutability or the technical term is interpretability um, or non-interpretability because it is one of, I think, the kind of false solutions on offer to the political problems that machine learning poses to the world. Um, so as I said, non-interpretable systems, which most of them are, it is impossible to deconstruct the black box such that you understand how certain parameters correlate with the output of the system. So in the Compass risk assessment score, it might actually be possible that the only thing that matters for the number that comes out of that system is how many friends you have who've gone to jail. That might be the case, that underneath all of the neural network computations are sort of one dominant parameter. Uh, we would never be able to identify that from the way the thing is built. But you can force a machine learning system to be interpretable, and you forfeit some accuracy in doing that. Uh, and this is being held up as a solution to problems of bias or problems of inequality or of panoptic power. Um, some people have raised the right to know your accuser as an objection to using machine learning risk assessment scores in a courtroom. But then you could know your accuser if you just force these predictive algorithms to be interpretable. Um, the, uh, it reminds me also of these, you know, per, this is very different, but it's kind of the same, the, the suggestion that what is required is the diversification of the tech industry. If you have more people of color or more women at Google, the tools that Google produces will be better. <laughs> um, and of course, it would be better to diversify the tech industry, but both the requirement of interpretability and the proposed diversification of the organizations who control all the data and produce all the predictions are just ways of reinforcing these more structural logics at work in machine learning, one of which is epistemological and about prediction, um, and, and another which is about, um, well, mostly that. <laughs> um, so that's not an answer. I'm, I'm not, I, wasn't, I wasn't sure quite what the question was, but I think there are lots of proposals to the, the political problems of machine learning that are actually just reinforcements of the bigger logic to, to focus on inscrutable systems, the collection of all this data, the making of accurate predictions, um, which, is, which is a problem. I also think there's another place where the political is at work in, I mean, there are, I mean, it's a weird way to frame it because the whole enterprise is political, but there is a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy to so much of this predictive work. The goal, of course, is to predict what will happen in the world, but if what you're trying to, if so Facebook always wants to predict what each of its users' political orientations are, and then they reinforce those political orientations by showing those people what they think they want to see politically, which then, of course, affects the political opinions of those users. Um, similarly, there's a project, this is my favorite, um, where there are now machine learning models that will do a nearest neighbor mapping of your face onto its most beautiful version that could be implemented with plastic surgery as now we have codified what beauty is in our sort of amazing database of photographs of celebrities and models and people that we agree are beautiful. But that's a case where we are sort of literally invited to build these predictive visions of the world back into our bodies. Um, so there's a kind of making, making the world while predicting things about it uh, that I think is one of the more troubling you know, political dimensions of this project. But I'm just so troubled by the, the character of the critique that comes out uh, of, of so many humanities disciplines right now that are about so we just have to diversify Google, but that does not get us out of these bigger structural issues. You know, Google employees just need a union 
Like that also does not get us out of these sort of other structural uh, issues um, and, and collapsing of possible futures that I think come along with it. And so I'm troubled by that. But I don't, I don't have a good, I mean, I don't actually know if the archives are like the solution to that problem. It's just a way of thinking about our own humanist practice of trying to have, you know, humble epistemologies that are tied to incomplete records that are historically and human made. And that seems like a valuable thing to bring into this conversation, I guess. I have four questions on the list. Uh, let's go ahead and we are running out of time. So. Um, thanks. Um, so I, I really like how these talks work together. My question is actually for Dan. Um, and um, kind of crystallized for me in your responses to some of the questions, especially from Suman and, um, and, and Lucas, was thinking about um, the question of style um, and the style portion of the talk. I can't remember who you were talking to, but you uh, invoked this dimension of like, the, the visual data visualization. And um, it made me think so, in, as well as the histories of quantification, there are different kinds of traditions of data visualization, right? And um, I was thinking just about a new book that came out um, by an edited volume by Bert Russer um, called um, David Fortress, which is looking at Du Bois, um, you know, different kinds of really sort of like beautiful um, depictions of data about um, uh, African Americans. Um, but I was also thinking about you know the sort of outsized role of media um, in a story, which you just you gesture to um, when it seems like what could be very in this enterprise, looking at the role or the, at the intersections between um, you know, sort of communication, science communication, media, theory, um, but also like design. Like who are the designers? What are the design elements? Like why is it that it is these like cliff party type like stock, you know, sort of figures? Like what is that? Does that sort of um, have its own epistemological and like moral baggage that comes Um, or just to maybe talk a little bit now about those questions of style and what are the other inputs that are mediating that in the time period that you're most familiar with, um, and what, what what does it mean to really take this seriously as a problem of like science communication, which there is a vast amount written, um, and seems like this could be a productive dialogue between your fields. Hi, I'm Laura Stark. I'm an interloper at Brown this year. Um, and I have a question um, for Steph. And I wanted to ask you about bodies. And I'm particularly interested in uh, this because you give us such a sharp um, periodization, which is nice to see for the 1950s and then a, a strong shift in the 1970s. And the shift from thinking about files, libraries, um, archives, and then um, shifting to um, things like incarceration um, and forms of uh, human databasing in which the things that are being reported, um, standardized and consolidated are um, bodily things. So um, fingerprints, faces, um, and your comment even um, previously about beauty. And so I'm struck by the idea that um, people create databases, but then databases also create people. So I want to um, push you a bit on your response that the your databases make worlds, um, that perhaps it's not just that they make worlds, but they make bodies. And I'm interested in if whether you would tap a periodization to how people comport themselves and deal with their bodies differently starting in the 1970s because of the different way in which databases are being figured. Uh, uh, thank you um, uh, very much for those papers and the risk of crude schematization. Um, I, I, I wanted to ask both of you uh, that uh, with the concepts uh, data, and I really think, Daniel, in your case, really um, big theory. Uh, um, you uh, seem to be wanting to delineate uh, a new episteme. Um, and, and yet, even as you do so, uh, 
um, uh, might I be right in thinking that you um, keep intact uh, a, a kind of prior um, uh, uh, um, a form of, uh, a, 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 let's call it a, a a critique um, uh, of the politics of epistemology uh, that belongs to, um, let's say, French anti-philosophy, Foucault, Deleuze, um, where the problem is always a problem of appearance, uh, so that uh, dominant knowledge systems, uh, new epistemes, uh, uh, have captured appearance, um, either through cr systems of cross-referencing, uh, Stephanie, or uh, let's say through the suspension of causality, Daniel, uh, that they've captured appearance. And uh, in so doing, something is hidden. Uh, and the problem is what to do with that which is hidden, except to make it appear. Uh, and I wonder if you agree <laughs> Uh, that you are uh, uh, caught up uh, with this, uh, the status of appearance in a long-standing critique of epistemology in, in, a, in, in, a, in the Western tradition, uh, A, and B, if there is another way of performing that critique in which appearance doesn't matter. Uh, this is also a question for Dan. I'm very interested in this, these, uh, your call to return economists' attention to description as part of this bigger call happening across disciplines to return to description as something um, that's interesting and also something that's political. And I'm thinking of that recent issue of representations um, on description across the disciplines. I don't think economics was represented in it, but many other disciplines were. Um, and I think, so, there's that big frame, and within that, I'm, I just have a clarifying question about exactly what work description has done in the time period that you're mapping in economics and what the correction exactly is that you're making, because if stylized facts have been around since the 50s, this is such a basic question, but is it that you are saying that they haven't been seen as descriptions since, since the 50s and that you're saying look these are descriptions or is it that you're saying and that people haven't self-consciously been trained to describe well um, I mean obviously they're a genre of thin description they're about decontextualizing uh, extracting and decontextualizing but or is it that they have been seen as descriptions but they haven't been seen as interesting um, and then I guess a really subsidiary clarifying question would just be, is it also that they haven't been seen as political within academia because clearly they've been seen as political this whole time um, in the popular sphere as all of your examples show. So why, is there such, what, why would this boundary object have such a divergent reception in the popular sphere versus in academia then? Sure. Uh, it's a quick question, maybe in reverse order. The, they were, they're so under sure description, but not as interesting. That's the point. And so economists are doing this work as prior to doing the work they care about. Um, but I think partly because of that, because they don't think of it as super important, um, even though it clearly is as part of the research process, they don't think about it in politics. And they also don't feel accountable for what other people do with it. Um, that's true across social sciences, but it's particularly true in economics, I think. And so they're, 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 there's just not, um, especially in the middle to, to late 20th century, as much of a care about the politics of reception of data and that kind of stuff, while there is for theory a little bit. Um, so that's, that's where it's coming from, um, to me. In terms of the question before that about uh, this being part of like a project of critique and a critique of appearance, um, I think it's hard for me to give this talk without sounding like that, but I'm not trying to be critical of style aspects. Like I don't, um, yeah, they're blurring of the world, but like that's how information works, right? Like you can't, if you, you know, Borges map territory, et cetera, right? Like you can't accurately capture all of the nuances of a social setting and get usable knowledge out of it at the same time. Like there's always some loss. And so I'm not against doing this work, I'm just against not recognizing that it's an important kind of work to be done and the choices being made in doing it are sort of political in a couple different ways. And so that's what the project is and about sort of thinking about how to do this better and to recognize the role of it more completely, but not because it's a problem that is sort of, um, that it's hiding something. That, I mean, it is hiding something, but like often it's hiding things that are perfectly fine to hide. Right? The problem isn't that. The problem is that you don't know what you did, or that you don't um, recognize that you have made a choice for somebody else. Um, 
Um, but often the choices that are made are perfectly reasonable, um, especially if you recognize how they're going to travel out or do better work of clarifying what it means to have made those choices. So, but it's not, it's not, I'm not arguing against stylized facts in some sense. Um, again, like I've, I've written a paper where I tried to produce one, basically. So, um, so maybe that answers the question. Maybe um, and then finally, oh, the style of, of data. I think it's a great question and a great point. And, I, and one of my big gaps as a scholar is just like I don't understand the media very well and their history. <laughs> it's a whole, the whole, it's own field, and I to dip my toe in, but it's a whole big mess that I don't totally understand. Um, I will say that for what's one interesting gap is that uh, social scientists are not trained to do visualization almost at all. Uh, I've taken multiple semesters of graduate statistics and never once has been like, what's a good graph in a conversation we had. Um, that's starting to change. You're seeing a lot more emphasis. Again, it's filtering over from, I think, from more public conversations, computer science conversations, machine learning conversations, where there's more discussion of that, of visualization, that's its own art. You can take classes on it and stuff. Um, but for a long time, social scientists produced really bad graphs. There were exceptions, Du Bois is one of them. Um, but there were these bad graphs or just tables, and then somebody else did something with it. And that somebody else, especially recently, has been like a graphic designer or a statistical graphics person at a media company. Um, and they all employ tons of them now. And that's part of the rise of data journalism is the rise of statistical graphics as a field and a profession. And so that is part of the story. But yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, Laura, thank you. Yes, so the motivation behind the pro that w what is currently a side project but may grow um, that is a history of facial recognition software is precisely about this question of how both embodied experiences of people in the world, uh, people in prison, people interacting with criminal justice infrastructure, as well as how the body becomes an indexer for identity in various reductive ways and highly racialized ways um, is sort of the question at the heart of the project. Um, and so, for example, there's the, the first sort of facial recognition algorithm that gets put forward in the 1960s has built into it an assumption about the three-dimensional sizes of heads. Um, all heads are assumed to have the same three-dimensional um, measurements so that they can correct any photograph to face from the side to face forward and then do like a point-by-point um, matching with a database of faces uh, provided by the New York State Police Department <laughs> um, to try to find a match. So from the, from the get-go, the idea that faces can be identified in an automated way has a racist assumption built into it that's bad technically and also bad um, ethically, and that is the proof of concept that motivates a certain kind of databasing, a certain kind of mugshot, a certain kind of assumption about facial recognition that sort of structures that database from, from the word go. Um, there's so much to unpack there, I hope I'll be able to do some justice to the story in the bigger project. Um, Leela, I don't have an answer for your question. It's a wonderful question. Um, and of course, you're absolutely right. But maybe a, part, a partial thought in response to it. Um, the first book I'm writing is a history of automated theorem proving, and every person in it is trying in some way to abstract knowledge and intelligence as much as possible away from the body and put them into the realm of symbols, um, symbols that are left out, symbols that are included, what are the symbols that are sufficient to capture human knowledge and human intelligence, and sort of one way to think about what our project as historians of science is in response to these people who are also theorizing the character of knowledge and intelligence the way that we seek to do historically is to resist utterly that knowledge and reasoning and expertise can be so reduced to the realm of symbols and to insist on situated, embodied, and historical accounts of how these people can formulate a historical disembodied, you know, symbolic representations of them. Um, and I think there's, that could be, uh, same could be said about this sort of desire to collect data and make it available and visible and, and whatever. That's, but that's a bad answer to your question. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all.